Welcome to the GameDev.TV Community Podcast. I'm your host, KB, and I would like to introduce you to industry professionals and people who successfully made their path to the video game industry. I hope that you enjoy the podcast and get useful tips that will bring you closer to achieving your dreams. Now, let's get right into the podcast. Welcome to the show, Rick. Are you excited to be back? G'day, KB. Yeah, good to be here. I'm really excited uh, for those people who are watching this, as opposed to just listening to it, that you're in some sort of love cage. Like that looks like the sort of place where you'd, you'd invite people to come back to my place. I'm, I've got a love cage. It's swinging. It's lovely. The mood, the atmosphere, a little umbrella behind you there. Yeah. Good for you. Like if all people in the world of game development had such a good setup, there'd be a lot more smiles going around, I reckon. That's luxury. Oh, there would be way more smiles. And also, I, I have candles you can set up back there. Maybe get some roses and set up a good mood. Goodness <laughs> me. This is, this is like the nest, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it goes everywhere. I can spin around the whole, the whole backyard. Work. How you been? What, what are we going to talk about? What's going on? What are we talking about? Why am what, I here? Why, why are is, you here, it? Rick? It's been, it's been a while. The last episode was, what, 30 episodes ago? But you know today, what happened last episode? I was, I was responsible for recording. And I think I only hit record halfway through and I think my audio wasn't working. It was just amateur. Hour. It was, I don't know. to be honest, it was awful. The podcast was made great. It as far as I have KB, honestly, <laughs> amateur hour. <laughs> I don't, it was like what, two and a half fault. hours. We lost two hours of it. Oh, that was so sad. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. Well, at least, at least you only waited two years to invite me back to have another conversation. Should we get Rick back? Oh, ugh, I don't know. Guy. Should we? But yeah, we got, we got you back on this time. I'm in charge of recording. So this time, if anything goes wrong, it's my fault. But I, you know. It's going to go well. I'll show you how it's done. But yeah, so yeah, I wanted well. to have you back on and talk about game design, uh, game dev related news, the new courses, and just how you feel about the future of like PlayStation 5, Unreal 5, all the, all the new stuff happening in the future for game dev. I read an article. Uh, I'm not super up on the news. I'm normally the last to know. But I, I saw an article on Facebook, which is, of questionable credibility. I've only seen it once, which leads me to wonder, was that real or fake news? Um, you know, is someone trying to get me to vote in a different way because of the fake news? But I saw that Microsoft has purchased Bethesda for a gazillion, bazillion uh, rubles. So I'm wondering, is that true? Am I dreaming? Did I hear that correctly? No, you, that's, that's not fake news. That's real. And they charge oh, a lot who, who of hooray? rubies. It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, Microsoft. Rubles. Maybe rubles. rubies as well. <laughs> yeah, rubies. Yeah. <laughs> I used to use the word schmeckles in my course because it's a Rick and Morty uh, reference to amount of money. That'll be 17 schmeckles. schmeckles. If you're a Rick and Morty fan, you'll know it. You're like, yeah. yeah. And then I had someone, someone write a comment uh, on one of our courses saying, uh, Rick, you know that schmeckles is a rude word, don't you? It means um, a, a man's you know, thingy uh, in, uh, in Yiddish or Hebrew or... or Oh uh, yeah, it, it, in in another language. So I recommend you stop saying it because it doesn't mean what you think it means. Like, but it's a Rick and Morty thing. It's like you know, Rick. So you have to wear the Rick outfit. You got to get the little like long gray hair. And get the little like shooting gun, the portal gun. I know. Then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's I've got the name. I'm not quite a Rick Sanchez in terms of my personality, though. I'm a little bit different to him. Um. So how's that? Bit. Did that answer your question? <laughs> I don't think it did, did it. <laughs> Random. It's sort of this. So to, yeah, where was I going with that? Um, so seeing that Microsoft owns some of my beloved titles of all time, one would assume that they're not coming to PlayStation anytime soon. I don't know if Microsoft's going to be like, you know what, let's just let Sony uh, have Fallout and uh, and Skyrim. Not a problem. You know, yeah, that's cool. No. So I think I think they've rolled the dice for the next generation of of what they think is going to be. Um, you know, a good way to move the needle, more exclusive content, which let me just dive into something here for a moment. I don't okay. think exclusive content is good for us consumers. So I watched a really interesting uh, video a while back. A guy was talking about Netflix and the phenomenon of on-demand streaming TV and saying that when it was mostly just Netflix dominating, it was great for consumers because you get there and you say, what shall I sign up to? And it was kind of like Netflix or, or nothing. Netflix <laughs> yeah, or nothing. Or, or YouTube, or torrenting it. This was what the article yeah. was mostly about. It was about torrenting. You used, back in the day, I heard that some people had the knowledge of how to do this. I've not myself never participated in figuring that out. But um, torrenting it, as Netflix became a viable, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty dollars a month, whatever it might be, you know, rubles. It used, used to be cheap, yeah, like eight dollars a month. Now it's like sixteen. 
Yeah, but it's still not too bad for everything, you know, all you can eat buffet of, of TV. But then what started happening was other streaming services putting content on their platforms and making them exclusive. So no longer could you go and watch Moana on Netflix because Disney's like, we've got this on our platform, which is very interesting because then as a consumer, you're like, oh, I don't want to get two of these things or three of these things. I will just go torrent it. So torrenting, you know, illegal pirating of TV shows has gone back up again because consumers have reached that, they've gone beyond that threshold of comfort. They're no, no longer saying, I'm cool to be paying for this. It's like, ah, you know, I, I, I want it. I don't want to have to pay a subscription to get it on every single particular thing. So it's interesting. The games industry has a lot of business models that people are trying and playing around with and experimenting with. I know that the, the PlayStations and um, Xboxes um, you know, and maybe soon steam, but to a lesser extent, but any of the, the platforms are playing around with subscriptions and get a whole bunch of products. And, you know, you don't need to buy one title at a time. You get a whole smorgasbord of them. You know, certainly, uh, Epic is in, in the battle nowadays with, mm -hmm. uh, marketplace giving away every, every week or so. Here's an awesome game for free. And it's like, yeah, it's like, I'll why not? That. Yeah. So it's, it's changing, man. It's really, it's, it's hard to know what's going to happen. And I think it's not going to be exactly what the people who are entering into those businesses expect a la the Netflix model. Cause if mm -hmm. everyone has exclusive content, everyone has subscription and everyone has come do my thing, you know, what's, what's the end result going to be? It's a little, little bit hard to predict. Yeah. It's, it's very hard because there's a lot of games that you want to play, but you're going to have to buy a whole Xbox for that. Or you're going to have to buy a PC for that or a PlayStation. It's just, it's just hard for people to keep up with. And then another thing That's I've been noticing is that a lot of mm -hmm. games are moving to like more subscription type of gaming or as a service. So you might get a game yeah. like Avengers where it's made, it's got a campaign and it's, it's a pretty good campaign, but like the rest of the game is now just multiplayer and they're going to build it for years to come. So it's like, should the game be finished or should, or should we focus more on just making a base game and then continue to build content forever? I mean, you know, I don't know. And then it's hard because some games are like, we'll pay $70 and a hundred dollars a year or just pay $70 and you're good for the rest of the it's like, I don't know. It's harder for people to now spend their money wisely because they're like, I get a game, but am I paying for the whole thing or am I paying for half of it? I don't know. Yeah. It's making it really difficult for indie game developers as well. And I think a lot of the people that are listening to us today are going to be uh, either indie game developers or aspiring to be a game developer or just interested in that space. It's very difficult because 10, 15, 20 years ago, you, you wouldn't have games as a service the way you do now. And you would make a title. It would be a good, whatever, 10 or 20 hours of fun, of great gameplay experience. Players would play it. They'd beat it. They'd, they'd get all the joy out of it. Then they'd move on to the next thing. And then the next thing and the next thing. Nowadays, the, the business model is, as you're saying, create a game as a service. So you can play that game as a player for a year or two years or three years and have a good time and be paying that same money. Like you're paying your whatever your $20 now and again, or your $30 now and again, that you would have used to buy different titles. Now you're putting all that into one title. So you get the mega behemoths like Fortnite, where someone mm -hmm. is playing that for a year or two and giving it whatever hundred bucks or 200 or 300 or some people more than that over that lifetime, uh, as opposed to buying a whole bunch of little titles. And my recommendation to indie developers nowadays is really look closely. If you want to make a story driven linear game, look very closely on how you can um, do that and have YouTubers play it and talk about it and get excited about it and have a different experience to every other YouTuber. Cause say, say KB, you get there and you're like, I've made a game and it's, you know, it's great. You go from A to B, it's 10 hours. It's just this beautiful story. There's a twist halfway through it. Oh, it's going to be amazing. The first time, a, the first time a YouTuber plays it gets halfway through. Wow. What a twist. Everyone now knows about the twist and the experience is a little bit um, diluted for anyone to go and play it in the future. Like, well, I've kind of seen this game. I don't need to play it. But if you're looking at a game, that's a sports game, racing game, a shooter game, an MMO it's every moment of that game is going to be slightly different for everyone who's playing it and streaming it and talking about it. So that creates the hype that gets people feeling like I need to be part of the club. If I'm not playing Fortnite right at the moment, then I'm missing out. So they go check it out and they play it and so on. So I think that's the rise of the free to play with microtransactions or with, you know, pay to have a better time. That model has really grown because of all the media, the social media, the, the streaming and the, the YouTubing around it. 
for the little indie who can't necessarily get that momentum of everyone's currently, you know, I'm the popular kid in town at the moment. It makes a really big challenge for, but what game do I create? What's, what's my niche that I can tap into and not try to compete with those big games as a service? Yeah, it's, it's hard. But have you seen Among Us? Have you heard about Among Us? Uh, I think so. It's a, I Tell think me, it was what sort made, of genre is it? It's a, it's a multiplayer game where you basically have objectives to do on a spaceship. But one person is the imposter, so he's going around trying to kill everyone. And so what happens is yep. he'll kill someone, he will hide, somebody will find a body, and then he'll do a meeting and be like, okay, who did it? It's kind of like Clue, but like in the, in the virtual yep. world. So that was made two years ago, and now all of a sudden, it's huge. It, it Twitch people are playing it. It's all over YouTube. Everybody's mm. like download it. And it's only $5 on Steam, and it's free on the phone. But it's like something crazy like that that only like three people made it. I think it was two artists and one uh, yep. programmer made something like that, and now it's just a big hit. And you don't even know. You didn't even plan for it. This is two years after the game came out. Yeah, that's crazy. I haven't, I haven't played that one. I've seen a little bit of the hype around. Is it, is it Fall Down? Players oh, Fall Down? Fall Out. Fall, down, fall Guys or something? Fall Out. Or something no, like that. No, it's, it's not. I don't think it's Fall Out. I think it's Fall it's Guys. It's the one with you got these little, little kind of cute little dudes and you have a, a race, 100 yeah. people racing to get the obstacle course. It's uh, Fall it's Guys really, Ultimate Knockout. Fall Guys. Thank you, Fall Guys. Yeah, yeah. I, I played that and I'm like, I don't understand how an, a game developer can predict that that will be the hype at the moment. So I heard that they got a, a good deal, good publicity, or maybe it was free on one of the, one of the stores or marketplaces. So that got momentum, which, you know, tip to indie developers. If you can get a lot of people playing your game, even if it's for free, then a lot of other people will say, Hmm, maybe I should check this out. Mm -hmm. um, but you couldn't, it's very hard to predict that, you know, what's going to be the successor to all of the battle Royale games that we've got at the moment. It's going to be other games where a hundred people start and you have some sort of interesting knockout, but it's not about shooting and running around and hiding. It's about something else. So, um, you know, there's a few things in there. One, who would have predicted that game would yeah. have had the success? It's like hard to predict, but if you look at it closely, it's like, hmm, well, it's logical because the world has moved away from the world of Warcraft, the MMO mm -hmm. type game, and then into the League of Legends um, um, MOBA. MOBA? Yeah, I've got all my... There's too many M's in there, man. There's MMO, yeah. MOBA. <laughs> MMO, um, RPG. I was going to say Battle Royale. That doesn't really yeah. have M's. Okay. So it's just <laughs> me getting old and losing my brain a little bit. But, uh, you know, the League of Legends style, um, Dota style games, and then that had its day in the sun, and then... Um, well, more recently, it's been the Battle Royales, hasn't it? Um, PUBG, Fortnite. And what's next? Maybe there's still the, the Battle Royales still got a new incan incantation uh, yeah. of the same sort of a whole bunch of people. It's knockout. There's pressure. Winner takes all. You can play the game in whatever, 10, 15, 20 minutes and then restart and have a new one, but not with guns and shooting. So mm -hmm. aspiring game developers out there, look at that. Look at what's look at what's big and then do a twist on it to see if you can capture a different sort of interest. Well, it's kind of like what Fortnite did when the whole coronavirus started and they had like in-game concerts. So people mm -hmm. could just go into these like live events inside a game world. And I actually, I honestly think that Fortnite is the closest we have to Ready Player One's like Oasis. Because you can be like any character from John Wick to Iron Man to Batman to a variety of characters mm -hmm. in the game I've never seen before. I've never played a game where you can be all these characters at once in a highly like multiplayer game, we can just constantly drop, constantly create stuff. Creative mode is amazing on Fortnite. The events, everything about that game is just like, let's keep making it for the players in this virtual space and just keep dropping. And I also think the graphics are the big reason why that game and Fall Guys is really big. It's just like colorful, it's playful. Mm -hmm. It's like, let's jump in and let's just have fun. Yes. And the important thing is it's different. So if you've been playing Battle Royale games for a while, uh, Fortnite was different enough to PUBG. PUBG is a lot more sort of realistic combat. Um, Fortnite's a lot more sort of cartoony, playful. And Four Guys is just more um, cutesy, kitty, yeah, bright, vibrant type approach. Um, I think that's a number one fundamental lesson for indie game developers is it's got to be different. You mm -hmm. can't just do the same thing as someone else. It'll just get lost in the mush, particularly if you're up against a, a team of 500 people. Like you just can't be, it, it can't be remotely the same. It has to be different. It has to be fresh, but it doesn't have to be a completely never thought of before, mm -hmm. amazingly different. You just 
change up the graphic style, change up the tone, the feeling, the experience, the mood, and you've got something that people can very much be excited by. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Now, let's get into some mm -hmm. questions because some people wanted to know about the new uh, remastered Unity course. Yeah, so um, to give a little bit of the depth to the question and show people more of the business side of what we do at Game Dev TV, uh, our goal in everything we do is to be the the best quality education and learning experience that people can get on the internet, not even on the internet between you and me. It's that they can get full stop when it comes to game development and programming. It, you know, just as good as going to university and listening to a lecturer talk about the, the topic is you can take one of our courses and it's, um, you know, it's, it's buttoned up as can be. It's tight. It's well created, mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and what happens is it takes us for one of our big courses, it takes between six months and 12 months to create all of that content for one or two instructors to be smashing away at it. On average, we, we finish about one video a day that includes the prototyping of what we're going to do, working out the learning journey, practicing the things that we're going to say, making sure that it's recorded well. And then to have quality assurance go through it, make sure we haven't made any mistakes, have students go through it and say what they can and can't understand to get it to the point where it's really refined. And it's something that the vast majority of people find that it works for them. And the challenge, my friend, is the fact that all of the game engines, uh, and, you know, all of the software that we teach changes so often that um, students come along and say, well, I've got the latest version and this button's in a different spot. Can you re-record the whole thing so the button's in the right spot? And so it frustrates us immensely that the button's not in the right spot or that the menu has changed or that, you know, Unity is a good example of now, now the prefab system is not totally different, but it's different enough that you recognize this is a different thing. Uh, so it creates a real challenge for us is how often do we recreate that content? Uh, if we just spend our entire time recreating it, then we don't get to do anything else. And our, our business is not very strong. We can't, you know, we can't sustain that just constantly making one course over and over and over. So we have to time it. And for our Unity 3D course, it's got to the point now where I personally feel that Unity is different enough that someone who's working through the videos, um, there's potential for them to be confused with that Uni Unity is a bit different. It's not for anyone who's got a little bit of experience, they'll be able to see it and they'll be able to know straight away what's going on. So, you know, that's, that's the preamble to how often we remaster or recreate our courses and why it takes a little bit of a time between, you know, between versions of it. But I'm currently working through the, the remaster using 2020.1, which I found a gigantic cinema machine bug in recently, which is oh, really? causing me to pull my hair out with tweezers because there's not much of it, but to pull my hair out, it's very frustrating. Is it, is it me or is it unity? <laughs> Unity's like, no, 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 it's not. You, That's where your hair went. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Went went to Unity. I don't, that's that's how they funded their IPO. I've got some hair from an Australian. It's, it's the Rick, <laughs> out. Let's do an IPO. Um, so it's I'm I've finished a new section one. So we previously had uh, Terminal Hacker, which was more of a text based section one, and and it was really really strong from the point of view of getting into the fundamentals of C sharp and programming without all of the having to worry about unity. But I personally think that when someone comes along to learn a unity C sharp course, they want to get in there and make stuff move around and bump into things. So I've made more of a move it around and bump into it. Section one, it's called obstacle course. And it's going to give students a chance to really create something that's their own. That's colorful and interesting and has movement and just weird and crazy. So I think it's a really cool section one. Is it kind of like fall guys? It. Like an obstacle course? It's very not like Fall Guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it could Fall be guys. though. Good question. Yeah. It, it's not multiplayer. Don't you go getting ideas into <laughs> our community's head about it. <laughs> Section one of the course is now a gigantic 100 player multiplayer. <laughs> like, hey, <KB2. laughs> He said um, it. No, it has to happen. <laughs> We could it could go. be. It's got the same. It's got the same sort of. You run along. I've got some spinners in there, so I can bump the guys out of the way. Things that drop from the sky. So it could totally be a prototyping of Fall Guys for yeah. sure. You could probably um, sell it to people. But I've, I've finished that, and we've got a review group that's helping make sure it's all buttoned up, and soon it'll be live to the to the general public. But I want to get a couple of sections done and dusted before we start getting the um you know anyone and everyone in there because I know people get a bit disappointed when they're they're like wow new stuff and then new stuff's coming out one per day and they're like oh why so slow 
Um, but uh, I, I'm nearly finished the next section, which is Project Boost. And we'll, um, we'll get all that out soon. Yes, for anybody asking that question, here it is now. It's, it takes time and effort to make these courses happen. It does. We don't now just, for the, uh, yeah. the Unity course, is there a new, like, not a Unity course, but Unity itself. Is there a new UI system? Because the guy was asking, is the new remaster course going to use a new UI system? I don't know which aspect of the new UI system he's referring to. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll be using whatever is the best system to use at the time. I know that's a really ambiguous answer, but um, it's, I, I love getting questions from the community because they often tip us off to the fact that there is something cool coming down the pipe, but it's mm -hmm. often in the, the alpha version of Unity or it's in a not as stable or, or it's something deeper, something more sophisticated, less for the beginners. So typically what we try to do is create a, a learning experience in the first, particularly in the first sections of the course that aren't reliant on the new latest and greatest that are just mm -hmm. good fundamental properties for or principles for programming, for game development, for C sharp, for using unity. So at the moment, uh, project boost doesn't have much UI in it, if any, but, uh, which section would start to get some UI? Maybe in Argon Assault, which is where we fly around on a rail shooter. Mm -hmm. When we redo that section, I'll definitely look to see what, what the latest and greatest is with Unity. But to be perfectly honest at this stage, I don't know much about um, the new, newest, latest and latest um, use UI system for Unity. I haven't dug into that much yet. Because mm -hmm. he even said too, he said, are you going to be utilizing awesome new addressables, input systems and the terrain tools like for the remaster Argon Assault? Yeah, definitely be using new terrain tools. Um, that's something that it's very frustrating because the terrain system up until one or two versions ago was pretty much the same, just with buttons in a different spot. Mm. But it, the, the layout, the menu is different enough. So when we're teaching it, we're saying, right, just do this and click on that and click on that. It's exactly the same functionality, raise and lower the terrain, move it around. But the menu is completely back to front and upside down. So... You know, I do apologize if anyone's worked through a course and they're like, it doesn't look what I've got on my screen um, and has had to go off doing a little bit of Googling for that. Um, my apologies for that. But the, the principles are the same. Mm -hmm. But yes, I will use whatever the latest and greatest terrain system is gladly. Oh, no. on that, I know that you can now punch holes in the terrain. You can have, you can have gaps in the terrain, which, yeah, you couldn't do that before. You couldn't, you couldn't go, oh, um, like... you couldn't cut out a piece of the mm -hmm. terrain. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty exciting. That's going to be very helpful. Because then it's easier to make like caves or different type of systems that before totally. you really couldn't do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pr I think it's I brainstormed this the other day. It's pretty much just caves. Yeah, you can punch through the terrain. What can you do? Caves. What else? Caves. Mm, caves. Yeah. caves. <laughs> More caves. <laughs> <laughs> There's people that have been outside Unity's office with little signs, placards, protesting. We want caves. We want caves. <laughs> this year I've seen that before. It's like, can you make us a cave? It's like, just, just put it together. You'll, you'll make it. It's actually not that easy, though, if you think about it, like making caves before. Because you would kind of mm. have to do it with assets that you had. Kind of fake that you're in a cave type yeah. of situation. Yeah. You have to do it with, lo with loading, load a new scene. You, you come mm -hmm. up to a thing, you kind of bump into the whatever, and then you load a new scene. But now you can actually just run right through it. Yeah, and boom, cave. Amazing. Yeah. I, I'm not sure what this too, but Yang, he was the one that said about the Yang polls. He was like, ECS slash DOTS plans when it comes out likely 2022 2023 i'm not sure if yeah. you know about that uh i know i know yong i know he um he ran our um or ran the game dev tv um game jam good man mm -hmm. uh recently he's been posting a whole bunch of really pretty um visuals world scenes landscapes he's oh yeah and unity on. day and so, night time yes yeah, yeah ecs i've been watching that really closely ecs a job system etc it we we will get to it soon um, and we'll, we'll definitely look into it at this stage. There's no, like a lot of people were thinking, Oh, there's a new paradigm. It's a paradigm shift. I have to use this, but that it, it's a tool or it's an approach that's very, very good for particular types of games, but not needed for other sorts of games. So rather than it being a technological advancement, it's more of a different, different approach, different philosophy or technique to use. And, uh, I find that for what we're doing, teaching people right from the very, very start, they don't need to worry about that just yet. Mm -hmm. It's it's not an and or. It's not do one or the other sort of system, learn one way or learn the other way. It's learn the fundamentals and then you'll be able to use the ECS approach if you wish. 
So I, I know it's on the radar. It's not, I don't think it's yet the thing. It's, it's not yet the ant's pants, as we would say in Australia. <laughs> Um, or the bee's knees. Do there you, you guys go. Say in bees the US, knees. Do you say either of those things? No, but bees I've heard knees. it so many times from you that it's just like, yeah, bee's knees, I got you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. That's exactly where you want to develop your vocabulary from is from a weird Australian. Yeah. <laughs> I went to the school of Rick. <laughs> I done good. I done um, good. Uh, yeah, we'll, we, 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 know, we know it's coming up. We'll get to it at some point. Not, not yet. And then how about the DOTS? Was that, was that the same thing? I think that's kind of in the same, in my mind, it's in a similar mm. category as, as ECS. They're all kind of, they're all mixed up in a similar sort of bucket. So um, we've got, I don't know if you've heard the news, but we're currently working on our multiplayer course that, um, you know, we're guessing that students want, no one has ever asked us for a multiplayer <laughs> yeah, nobody, course why would a they million want one? times. No, no. Why, what would be useful about that? So, uh, we're working with a, a gentleman named Dapper Dino. Nathan is his he's great. Uh, his RL name, and he's working on a um, an RTS multiplayer, which is just a mm-hmm. oh, dream come true. I love RTSs, and, and me too. Making RTS multiplayer is so cool. So um, he's going to get it to the point where it's playable. It's not going to be. It's not quite going to be Command and Conquer, Red Alert. Um, Warcraft oh, style of you know Starcraft style. Not yet. That'll be up to the we'll to the student who learns all the 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 stuff to go and take it off and and have it become the next Starcraft. But he'll get everyone to the point where they've got all of the framework and they've got a fun game that they can use. Um, so we're working on that, and you know he's he's got a lot of great Unity knowledge and he's pretty passionate about these sorts of things, particularly the more advanced. Mm-hmm. Um, he's also been to Unity, Unity events. Might we might be able to twist his arm to work on some more intermediate content, perhaps. Yeah, we'll see. No promises. No pro- I know that's what people want. Where is the intermediate content? It's coming. Yeah. So he also asked about URP slash HTRP, shader graph, and visual effects graph. More is question marks, meaning is that going to happen? Yes or no? Is this still Yong asking yeah. these questions? Yeah. <laughs> Goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very nice of him to put us on the spot. Right? Um, yeah, it's again, it's it's tricky because a lot of what he's asking for there are more intermediate to advanced um, conversations. And if there's if there's enough people in the community say we want to know more about shader graph or we want to know about this, then we make it happen. Um, but a lot of people are just at the stage of saying I I just want to make a thing move around and shoot. Can you yeah. show me how to do that? And they're not yet at the point of of super deep stuff, and you know, I'm, I'm really interested in shaders. I'm, I'm, you know, my, my designer mm-hmm. heart speaks to having things play well and look nice and have immersion in there. Um, but interestingly, a lot of our community is uh, really interested in the fundamentals of programming and mm-hmm. of how do I, how do I build it? So it's functionally sound. And then after they've got enough, in that realm where they're saying, I'm pretty comfortable with this. Then they say, now how do I make it look pretty? So um, that's often, often what stops us from getting more heavily into things like shaders. I know that there's a massive technical programming component to it, but it's mm-hmm. often with the goal of making things look good and look shiny and look a particular way. Yeah. So um it, it's one of the, it's a bit of a juggle. It's very technical, but it's also very artistic. So that narrows down the number of people that are banging on the door saying, please give this particular thing to us. Mm-hmm. I see that more being like an additional lecture, like section, not an actual mm-hmm. course on it. Yep. Right. Now, yep. One of his last things, and it's basically, I think the whole thing he's trying to get at is like, he just wants you to list all the new stuff you'll be incorporating into the new course. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i thought which is code for <laughs> i don't know yet <laughs> yeah um oh, that's funny yeah it's good good question yeah new stuff the problem with new stuff as well is that if we go out of our way to do new stuff and then unity changes it so it's it's like well it, we've changed how the new stuff works then we've kind of found ourselves in a spot where we've taught something that gets deprecated or isn't used the way we thought it would be used so a lot of what we try to do in our, our big, uh, you know, complete unity developer or complete blender or complete unreal is to teach the principles, the fundamentals that no matter what the engines do, these fundamentals and these principles are still going to be sound. 
so that if there's a new shiny thing come along, people have the, they already have the framework and they have the ability to interpret the new shiny thing and, and figure it out and implement it themselves rather than us continuing to chase the new shiny things and people have that gap in, yeah, but how does it fit into, how do I, how am I structuring it? How do I do this? Mm-hmm. So I know it's a bit of a crappy answer for our intermediate to advanced yeah. users out there, but um, when we're talking about the beginner courses, we try to keep it very beginnery and then we're always exploring ways to give more intermediate and advanced content to our, our crew. And um, yeah, so we, we get it. We're, we're, we're trying to, we're working our best at that. Okay. That was great. What you said about fundamentals. Cause I did a interview with a CEO and she was like, the one thing is like, I never forgot my fundamentals and it just shows how important it is to remember where you started all the basic stuff so that we can build upon all the advanced stuff. Yeah. And there's, there's a difference between, um, being like being educated Mm -hmm. and being capable. I think Mm. sometimes we get those things a little bit mixed up that, okay, I've been taught how to do X, Y, Z, and I've got that in my repertoire. I can, I can regurgitate this information. I've got the knowledge, which is different to, but I can build a thing. I can execute, I can get it done. And most of what we're trying to do is to get people that are capable, that they can solve problems, that they have the the principles, the framework, the understanding, but also the, the excitement and the desire to do that. So it's, that's sometimes a little bit in conflict with teaching the, here's the new technique to use. It's a lot more about, we want to teach you how to think. We want to teach you how to solve the problem. We want to teach you the, the mechanism to go through to understand this. Yeah. That was beautiful. That, that's our goal anyway. That's what yeah. we're trying to do. I like that. Yeah. No, because there's a lot of courses you can find on there where it's just like, here's how to do it. But we never really asked you how to think about how to do it. So at the end of the video, they're like, I don't even know what I did. That happens a lot. Like a lot of people, even in the community forum, will be like, I still don't get it. And it's like, okay, then probably have to go back to the course, maybe slow it down, take some notes, find a new way. But you need to grasp this part before you can expand to do whatever else you want to do. Absolutely. And you know what's really interesting? I, I, don't, I don't share too much my own programming journey with people or even my, my, my game design journey is a little bit different mm-hmm. um, and not as relevant for this conversation. But with programming, you know, it took me at least a, a year or two, maybe a couple of years, just to understand the fundamentals myself. Oh, that's what a class is. Oh, that's how, you know, that's what's mm-hmm. happening when I do a callback. Oh, that's these things. It, you just have to do it over and over and over and hear it seven different ways. And eventually you're like, ah, now, I, now it fits within my mental model. It, it clicks together. It makes sense. So um, I, I know there's a lot of students who will go through 10 hours of a course, ours or others. They're like, I still don't understand this stuff. I'm still not a programmer. And it's just something that you have to do over and over mm-hmm. and over many, many times until it's, it's kind of the habit of Oh, that's why I put these things at the top of my script. Oh, mm. it's because then I can do it down the da Or that's why I um that's why I use inheritance like this because I can then separate this and that. Oh, it, so it's the sort of thing that it takes it takes time to actually sink in. And my advice to anyone out there who's at that stage of saying it doesn't quite work, I don't quite get it, it doesn't quite make sense, I'm not good enough, it's not getting there yet, is just time, keep going, just keep doing it over and over and over and over and then it's going to sink in and it's not necessarily that that person's doing it the wrong way or they're not clever enough or their brain doesn't work the right way or that it's not explained the right way. It's just sometimes you have to practice a thing a bunch of times before it, it uh, gets in there. No, a hundred percent. Cause actually I watched a video a couple weeks ago about, it was like a whole crash course in C plus plus. And after watching, I was like, everything that I've been learning for the last two years, like clicked at once. I was like, Oh, I get it now. And then I started working on this game and which is easier than ever was before. I was like, finally, after like two and a half years, but still it's a long time, but it takes patience and time. And all the people have interviewed it the same way. Some people have spent years, years to get where they are today. Even one girl like dropped out of school, did her own thing for like three, four years, and then went back to school, (laughs) killed it and worked at Blizzard and now works at Unbroken Studios. It's like, wow, you can still stop for a second. Doesn't mean you're giving up, but like take a break and then come back like a year later and refresh and focus and ready to get after it. Yeah. It's, you know, it's really difficult for us as, as people who create um, video training content is finding the balance between having it too dumbed down and too simple, Mm -hmm. but also having it too fast and too complex. And it's interesting. I, you know, I'll, I'll watch 
a video that I created a while ago, or I'll watch one of Ben's videos. Uh, if I'm looking to see how did Ben do it, how shall I do it? And if I already know the topic, it all just clicks. I'm like, yep, yep, know that. Oh, okay. Yep, 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 yep. Good, good, good. If it's a topic that I don't know, I haven't done before, I haven't seen for a long time, I'll watch it. I'll be like, wait, what? Why is that? Wait, there's some assumptions mm -hmm. that we don't even realize we're doing. And we get messages, comments, reviews all the time. 50% of the negative reviews we get are, this is too fast. You guys aren't helping the beginners. This is not a beginner course. You guys are garbage. And the other 50% of the negative comments are, this is too slow and too boring. Oh my God, treating me like a baby. And it's really difficult to cover everything so that the, the people who haven't done anything before and the people who've done some before uh, feel that it's delivered at the right speed in the right way. You've just got to go slower for someone who's never done it before. And you've just got to go quicker for someone who has done it before. So it's all about finding that sweet spot. And that's, that's really tough to do. But my point on this is if someone's out there and finding that the, you know, they're, they're either that beginner or they're, they're that advanced person is sometimes just finding a different, um, a different educator or a different course or a different, different stage of the conversation will help you flow quicker because that person's pitching it at where you're at right now. And then it could be if you're watching the beginner stuff, a year later, that person who's more advanced, that's exactly what you need. Yeah, it's just about taking account of like where you are, what you need to work on, and then maybe changing some things. But, but usually it's more of just like, just assessing what you need to learn at that moment. You might have to go back to all the fundamentals, no matter how boring it might be. It's like you might need to fill in the gaps that you missed and you didn't know. And now you're trying to learn new stuff and it doesn't make any sense because you're missing that little sweet spot. Yep. So yeah. Programming, programming and game development is just like going to the gym. You, you learn the technique from the trainer. You know, here's how you do a squat. Here's how you do a bench press. Here's how you do leg curls, whatever it might be. You know, here's how you do a star jump. They show you the technique. They show you the position. At first, you're not going to do the technique properly. You're going to not have your back arch the right way. You're not going to bend your knees the right way, but you give it a shot. You work on very light weights so that you can, you know, you can do it without hurting yourself. And then as you progress, you, you get better at the technique. You get stronger. You can do it more and more. You don't need the trainer there as much anymore, or if at all, because you now know the technique, but you've got to keep working on it, working on it, working on it till you get to the point where you can do the heavy lifting that you really want to do. That's going to, you know, have you be super buff and walk around at the beach saying, check me out. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's the same in game development. You, you've got in your mind this game you really want to make. You know, I've always wanted to make an a MMO. It's going to be amazing. But, uh, you know, it might take however many years to get to the point where you've got the, the programmer equivalent of the muscle strength and technique to be able to execute that. Up until then, you just have to be excited about the fact that, oh, you know, I'm, I'm lifting 50 pounds. That's pretty good. And that's, that's meaningful. And that's something that's a good thing to do. You just can't start off at, you know, 500 pounds. Yeah, it takes time. Now, uh, somebody was asking, how do you feel about the increase in VR market? The increasing what, sorry? VR market, virtual reality. Oh, I thought you said DR. I'm like, oh, goodness, I don't know what DR is. I'm going to look like an idiot again. Okay, but I do know what VR is. Yeah. <laughs> It's hopes so, right? virtual racing. No, it's, it's I, I know really all good. about virtual racing. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> no, VR. So virtual reality is my understanding of that. What I, I don't know. It's interesting. I VR has been a conversation now for what five, ten years. I, I still feel exactly the same way that I've always felt about it, that there's gonna be a X percentage of the market that just loves the pants off it. They can't get enough of it. it might be 10%, might be 20%. There's going to be the rest of the market that just doesn't give a, you know, doesn't give a damn about it. And for me, I get dizzy easily. <laughs> is uh, This is full self-disclosure here. If I was to, you know how you get the broom? This is what you do when you're young and you have too many alcoholic beverages. You get the broom, you look uh... up in the sky and you spin around. I would do that about one and a half times. And I'd be like, I need to go off to hospital, you guys, because I'm not feeling well. <laughs> it's just, I'm not so good on roller coasters. So for that point, VR games or VR, anything VR where you just put on the goggles and you look pretty much straight ahead. I'm cool. I like those. Mm. Anything that makes you look left because there's a spaceship, look right, there's another spaceship. Um, just moving my head left and right like that. I'm like, oh, I couldn't do that too many times. Makes me a bit dizzy. So th that's kind of a long rambly way of saying VR is not a good match for me. So I'm not going to be in the <laughs> VR audience. Certainly not going to be a VR developer. Me being a view, like testing a VR game, I'd just be like hurling all day long. It'd be gross. Um, so I think that's, 
you know, my particular, my particular sort of dizziness thing isn't going to be everyone's thing, but there's going to be a lot of people who don't like putting on goggles. A lot of people who feel that it's, it's too antisocial because you kind of hidden behind your mask people who, who just aren't into it. So I, I think it's awesome. It's amazing. There's so much you can do. I'm excited by put the goggles on so you can do your real estate shopping from anywhere in the world. You know, there's a lot, of, a lot of things starting up. Mm-hmm. You can, you can put the goggles on and you can go to the hardware store, you know, virtual hardware store and you know, Oh, that's what this tool is and how it works. And you know, doctors can train. I think the real world applications for VR are way more exciting than the video game applications for VR because you know, call me a heathen, but I think video games are pretty cool even without VR. So I don't long for them in VR. I'm, I'm already immersed in the game. Um, and I don't need, I don't need to be immersed even more, um, at this stage. So answer that that's a long ask answer to your question, but I I'm excited by it, but it's just, just the same excitement that everyone's had for the past five, six, seven years. Yeah. And did you hear that with the, um, VR sickness, apparently it's because your brain doesn't know what's going on. So it thinks you're poisoned. So it tries to get it out of your system or something like that. I heard. And I was like, is that true? Dude, my brain often doesn't know what's going on. So, <laughs> so I'm just walking around through life with VR sickness. I think, Rick, what, did, what did you say that for you idiot? What are you <laughs> doing? <laughs> going, Rick, don't eat that. You're fat enough as it is. So yeah, I get that a lot, um, but you know, it's, it's, I think it's a middle ear kind of thing as well. It's mm. the same thing. If people get car sick or boat sick or roller coaster sick, you know, it's all middle ear wonkiness. I mm. think it's because it's when people have really powerful brains, they just can't, you know, and they're really smart and handsome. They just can't process. Oh yeah, sort of, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that must be, <laughs> must be. It right. has to be. I it. tell my wife anyway. <laughs> How does she feel about that? <laughs> well, she's, she doesn't have the same problem as me. So she kind of, yeah. <laughs> she does not necessarily agree with my conclusions. I don't know if anybody else would, but we'll keep, we'll give it to you. Yeah, thanks. Now, <laughs> now, someone asked, if you could be a 90s retro video game character, who would you be? Wow. Um, interesting question. I, I, mostly because I have trouble remembering what I did last week, let alone right. what I did in the 1990s. <laughs> I was around thought you playing would know. video games in the 1990s. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the sad thing is Duke Nukem popped into my head, but I don't want to be Duke Nukem. I don't even know if he's 1990s. Um, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. But Mega, Good question. Mega Boy? What was I playing in the 1990s? I was playing, you know what popped into my head as well just now is in 1993, I think, I was playing a, a, a MUD. So a multi-user domain or dungeon, depends what you're up to. Uh, and it was one of the very, very, very first MMOs that you could play. And it, it's text-based. And this mm-hmm. is when I was in studying in university. And everyone was just into it. And that for me is a little bit of the 1990s is text-based internet games. Um, just being able to, like, I can talk to a person in America. I can talk to a person in England. <gasps> mm-hmm. Whoa! It just blew our minds. Let's run around and east, 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 north, 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 south, east, north, north. It's like one of those games. I don't know how we remember. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, too I don't much know. Time. <laughs> Kill monster. And, you know, back in the days where video games where you sit there for for 25 minutes to do a thing. And if you die in the last 30 seconds, you have to go back and do the 25 minutes all over again. They were the days of video gaming. Yeah. Um, the good old days. That's, that's a really rubbish answer to question. But um, <laughs> I don't know. There's no, there's not really any video game characters that bad. I've ever aspired to. I mean, the, I, I think not, not certainly not the nineties, but um, the uncharted series uh, type thing. I, I, I can like, see you being I, Sully. Oh, can you now? Yeah, because they're doing the movie now, and nobody really likes Mark Wahlberg apparently for the role. So I was like, you know, we need oh. Rick Davidson. <laughs> oh my goodness! Hi, I'm here to audition for Sully. <laughs> Mark Wahlberg's no good. <laughs> That's me doing an accent. I don't know. That was uh, horrendous. I think. It was, I think Ben would approve yeah. though. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, that's cool. I mean, it's really interesting you ask that question, and I don't have a good answer to it. It's like, mm-hmm. um, and you let him down. Game it was a guy on Instagram. Yeah, sorry about that. Well, I figured out his name. Jordan Heaton asked the question too. He said, "What about the Sega between Epic and Apple, and how it's impacting small and real developers on the Mac and iOS platforms?" Yeah, I mean, it's scary. Any anything where the the big boys throw their muscle around, 
and kind of the little guys get squashed is very scary. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, f- again, full disclosure, I haven't gone and researched all of the ins and outs of this. Um, I look at it that there's two businesses that are trying to make money and trying to make as much money as possible. And, you know, Apple's coming from a position of, well, if you want to be part of our ecosystem, you've got to play by our rules. Whereas, um, you know, Epic's got their own ecosystem that they need to protect as well. So um, the, the harsh reality, I think, is if you want to put your, your bag of potato chips into the supermarket, you've got to play by the supermarket's rules. You don't have a choice. And if you're like, I don't like these rules, the supermarket, in my capitalist opinion, is entitled to say, cool, well, then just don't put your, your potato chips in our supermarket. And then the potato chip manufacturer says, yeah, but then how do I sell my potato chips? And the supermarket says, I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> like we've got plenty of other things to sell here. Don't worry about it. So if there's any sort of, um, any sort of conflict, unfortunately, it pains me to say this, but Apple can do whatever the heck they want because mm-hmm. they made the supermarket. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's my sort of very, very high level, a little bit naive, ignorant view of what, what the issues actually are. But uh, it's the same conversation when people get upset about Steam. It's like, cool, we'll just go sell your, your game elsewhere. Well, there's nowhere else to sell it. Cool, well, then stop complaining. You know, it's, yeah. it's the very, very harsh reality of the, the con- consumerist world we live in that there's a, a lot of opportunities. But if you want to kind of break those opportunities, then, yeah. It's, it's tough. Business is tough. Reality yeah. of those things are tough, but mm-hmm. um, I think both companies will figure out a solution. And often these things, my gut tells me often these things are posturing to get a better deal as opposed to it's all going to break down, but yeah. it, it would certainly be heartbreaking if any unreal developers out there can't publish their games on the app store. That'd be, that'd be just gut wrenching. Yeah, that's what I heard the rumors are that that's happening. Yep. But we shall see in time. So Zoe asked, how has the game TV community changed over the years? Mm. Um, not much, to be honest. It's when I first, it was four or five years ago when I first started um, partnering up with the, with the team and then becoming part of the team myself. Um, the community was amazing, supportive, um, cooperative, uh, giving lots of amazing feedback. The, the whole fundamentals of what we've done has been built on the fact of we will create what we think is the best possible thing, knowing that it's not good enough and then listening to what the community says about it in order to improve it. That's been our philosophy from day one. And side note, if you're a game developer, you, sh- you should have exactly the same philosophy, which is your game is not amazing until the community says it's amazing, no matter what you think about it. You're making a product for someone else. You're not making a product for you you know, you and your parents, it's not what your mum thinks about it. It's what the person who's going to pay X dollars thinks about it. So the community is amazing now as it was then. There's more of the community. Uh, I think the, the game jam aspect, the fact that people are, um, so many people participated in the game jam was super exciting to see people teamed up together. Yeah, that was awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, really, really awesome. The, probably the biggest change that I've seen in the last couple of years has been really people embracing the discord community um way back in the day there wasn't we didn't have a discord community and then the community went and started the discord community like we really want discord i'm like okay well cool well okay we'll get in there and help it and and make it happen and now there's you know you go online and there's ten thousand people just in the discord server hanging out helping each other out being supportive and positive um and a lot of it's on the on the shoulders of our spectacularly good moderators administrators community support um community evangelists uh, the folks who are out there like making it happen and doing it because they love it and doing it because they they want to be part of part of the tribe part Mm -hmm. of our clan so um yeah i've noticed too ever since i've been like commenting on all the people's show stuff on blender on real unity on the forum more people are commenting on other people's stuff and everybody's just like this like snowball effect They're like let me comment on this person you did a great job you did a great job everybody's yep. doing a great job it's amazing it, you know what's really cool kb is that so much of the media we're exposed to nowadays even the social media but traditional mm-hmm. media as well is negativity fake news you know mm-hmm. my team's better than your team 
um, you know, vote for me, not for that guy because he's evil. There's so much of that. And I think as humans, we crave to be part of a tribe where people support each other and cheer each other on and, you know, give constructive feedback. But it's not about I want to be better than you or I disagree with you or my way is better than your way. It's let's all win together. And I think that's what we've got in in our community here. There's there's tons of other communities out there that are amazing with this as well. It's not just the Game Dev TV community. There's lots of communities where hey, you can find you this. You tell me it's not the greatest community yeah. ever? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's from my, it's the greatest community that I'm part of or I've been part I like, of. Yeah. Just because we all, we all want everyone else to win because that's, that's okay. <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not in competition with each other. So that's why I think the community is just so good. Yeah, it's like we can all make amazing games, not just one person. So why not just help each other? Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Now someone asked, what would be your dream course to make? Mm. I made my dream course, which was a motivation course. I, I'm really passionate about it. Two dream courses, I think. One was the how to get a job in the games industry, because I've been teaching that topic for a long time at video game schools. And just personally, I've been a um, you know career coach a lot. and I love, I really love seeing people go from, I don't know how to present myself. I don't know how to get a job. I, I've got no experience. How do I get experience? I love to see them go from that to, oh, I got a job offer. That for me is like, oh, I was part of that journey for that person. They had untapped potential. They just needed to shape it. And now they've succeeded. I love that so much. And from a motivation point of view, I, you know, I myself have spent many a years procrastinating and feeling bad and guilty about that procrastination and the the techniques that i've used myself to motivate myself work for me but might not work for other people and something that works for someone else might not work for someone else so putting all that together in a course here are all the things that you can try that you can do and here's a reason to believe in it to finish your project that you're working on because if you finish stuff in life you're a lot happier than if you don't finish stuff in life doesn't necessarily matter what gain you get from completing the thing, but if you finish it, it makes you feel good about what you're up to in life. So those two are my dream courses. I created those. And now it's more a case of creating the courses that the community asks for mm. more so than me saying, what's my dream course. Yeah. So that's, well, that's, that's an awesome uh, life journey, a mission to motivate mm -hmm. other people. No, cause it's, it's sad. Cause sometimes you'll see a lot of people who are, more creative but don't have that i guess push or that that, that uh, support group that helps them grow and it's like your your, mm -hmm. your stuff's better than even what i can do why go do it please and i'll, I'll help motivate them and, and there's other people who've had dreams and stuff like for instance me going to la i i told people hey like you can make it happen it takes a lot of work and stuff but you can do it i like to show people that they can do it so that they can go and do creative work and, and make a difference in the world and feel better about themselves yeah it's interesting. I'm, I've been tapping into a new technique recently, uh, which is about getting angry in order to get motivated. And, uh, you know, a lot of personal development is about getting leverage on yourself. So making a very big commitment you can't get out of. So for example, I promise I'll have this done by the end of the year. And if I don't, I'll run down the street naked and everyone can laugh at me and throw tomatoes. Like, you know, then you're like, Oh, I've really got to get this done. That's like leverage. That's massive leverage to take massive action you know, assuming that you don't want to run down the street naked and have people throw tomatoes at you. Some people might <laughs> yeah. be like, oh, that sounds pretty, pretty spiffy, actually. <laughs> don't tell so, Ben about that. You know, obviously, I, <laughs> I saw the smile on your face. I'm like, okay, maybe some people interpreted this a little bit differently to what I was saying. Um, but I, I've, there's also a, a bit of a philosophy out there that if, if you get to the point where something makes you angry, you will take action. So for me, just a little example recently, I've no, I've not been, had a chance to exercise as much as I'd like to. And I haven't been looking after myself quite as well. You know, if it, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's minor. It's like an extra pound or two. But for me, I'm like, look at that disgusting. You know, I've let myself go. I'm not looking after myself. I need to, I'm so angry that I'm not exercising the way I used to. Part of it is because I've been injured. So I'm like, cool, what do I have to do? I've got to go to the physio. I've got to get this looked at. I've got to get it fixed. I've got to stretch. I've got to do, you know, um, strength training so I can get to the point where I can run a couple of days a week, which is what I like to do and ride a bike a couple of days a week. So I, I went from the point of saying, Oh, this is kind of difficult. Oh, I'm kind of injured. I don't know. To being, I'm really mad that I've got myself in this situation. I'm going to take action. So the, the reason I'm going on this bit of a rant at the moment is 
um, for me, that technique may not have worked a year or two ago, getting angry about things. I don't want to get angry. That's not how I roll. But it's, it's like anything in life. You need to challenge your concept of what works for you and come up with a new thing. That's why people read more, you know, read books over and over. It's, you, you don't read one book and you've got the answer. You need to read a book every couple of weeks or every month to get a new way of looking at a thing so you can try it with fresh eyes and put that into your life. And whether that's motivation or game development or new programming techniques or new engine to look at or whatever it might be, just keep looking at the same problem through a different lens and that'll give you momentum and force to work on it. 100%. And actually, a lot of stuff that's been coming up with these podcasts are people going through like mental health or dealing with stuff because they're not learning fast enough or they didn't get a job right out of school or stuff like that. So I was wondering, how do you feel about mental health in the industry and how people should cope with it, I would say? Yeah, I mean, mental health anywhere. It's tough times at the moment, really tough times mm -hmm. um, with, with people being in lockdown, people seeing riots on the street, people just... There's so much for people to worry about. I think mental health, just everywhere, not just in the games industry. Um, I, I worry about it a lot. And part of, I mean, this, uh, I'm tempted not to have this conversation with you because it could, it could go astray, but I will because I trust you and I know you'll do the right thing with it. Okay, I know our, anyone listening at the moment, you know, the, the five people that are still with us after me rambling as I've done thus far. I think um, they all left actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. Oh, okay, just you and me then. You and me. Thanks. Life to the heart. Um, I only have myself to blame. So the video games, like anything in life, if used correctly, are amazing. And I've played video games my entire life. I've used video games as a meditation, stress relief, connecting with other people, challenge myself activity. Works very well. In, throughout my video game playing journey, there's been many, many, many times where I've overindulged to the point where it's been damaging to me and my life. You know, MMOs, I now, I can't go near them. They're just like, it's not something that you just play for 20 minutes and say that was fun. It's like 12 hours later, it's like, oh, I've leveled up four levels. That was amazing. Oh my God, where did my life just go? So I think there's a real conversation that the video game development industry doesn't have about the product that they make. The product that we make, that we create, is a product that can very easily have people not go out and fulfill their dreams in life. And part of the thing that gets a little bit messy is as video game developers or people who are learning how to code or people who are learning engines, you're like, but I'm doing it. I'm taking action. I'm building a thing. I'm now a creator, not just a consumer. And I'm liking creating. But the thing is what we're creating is a product that other people can consume. It's a little bit like saying, um, I don't want to eat a whole bunch of pastries and cakes because that's, if I eat too many of them, it's not good for my body, but I'm going to become a pastry chef. And then being a pastry chef, the better you are as being a pastry chef, the more pastries people are going to eat, which you eat one pastry a week, not a problem. You eat, two pastries a day, big problem. So that's something that I think as the video game development industry, we, we need to be very conscious about that there are a lot of people out there who can't handle it, that can't, that don't have alternatives in life. And let me go one step deeper on this. this the psychology of this is if you or I are sitting at home thinking, ah, oh, my life is kind of dull, don't have much going on, I'm not winning on a daily basis, you know, maybe you don't have a, a life partner. Maybe you don't have a job that you're interested in. Um, you know, maybe you look around your surroundings and there are whatever. On top of that, you look around your surroundings, there's a lot of coronavirus stuff going on. And it's a real challenge. You jump into the video game. You're like, I have a goal. Okay, I need to get from A to B. I need to destroy this many things. I need to collect that many things. Great. Oh, finally, I've got something to focus my time and energy into this goal. Great. And then you achieve the goal and you're like, I did it. I won. I feel so good about that. And this is why you and I and the people listening love video games. That is a spectacularly useful tool. The concern that I have is for people who, if video games weren't there for them, would push a bit harder and find something else in their life that could grow and become a thing. For example, oh, maybe I'll learn guitar. 
uh, maybe I'll start gardening. Maybe I'll exercise some more. Maybe I will go down to my, you know, maybe I'll find a meetup group and do a thing. And I'm not saying, just to be clear out here, I don't want this to be snippeted and put around the internet and like, this guy's a jerk, is I'm not saying one is better than the other. Both are great. But I think a lot of the mental health is, comes from people who get all of their positive reinforcement and winning in life from video games. And if that wasn't there or if they did less of it, then they would get that from other areas. And those other areas can lead to tangible skills that you can then apply in other areas of your life. If you learn to play the guitar, you can go and play in a band or play with your friends or down at the beach. You know, you can a lady that you're interested in, but you, it's very difficult to serenade the lady with, <laughs> with, a, with a PlayStation controller. They're not as into that as, as I would like, you know, from hey, you my younger days. Like, like, look at me. <laughs> look how cool I am at Call of Duty. It's like, really? Um, and so and it's also it's yeah. also job related skills it's trade related skills it's it's physical related skills so i know the video game industry has tried you know the wii is now very active you know when the wii came as active but that's not really an alternative to going and learning judo or taekwondo or karate it's not really something that has you walk down the street feeling like you know confident in your body and your skills so mental health, I'd say anyone listening to this that struggled a little bit with mental health, and, and I certainly have myself, you know, not as, not as extreme as a lot of people out there who are doing it really tough. But, you know, if, if you've been bored, if you procrastinate, if you've been a little bit down in the dumps, if you've been unsure of yourself, that's all mental health, is moderate your consumption, as in do less consumption and do more creation. That's, that, I think, is the secret. You don't have to get rid of consumption. And when I say consumption, I mean playing games, watching videos, um, you know, watching TV shows, et cetera, all that kind of stuff. It's all, it's all very similar for me. That's, that's leisure. It's consumption. Do it. Do it an hour a day, not five hours a day. Do it, you know, do it in moderation. And then the rest of the time, go out and create, build skills, build life skills, connect with people, face-to-face -face conversations as much as you can. And I think that's the secret to mental health. And for you and I, KB, if we're making games, that's our creation. We've kind of solved it. We're like, we, but we're, we're learning new skills. We're learning programming. Um, we're helping other people learn that we're in a community. We've kind of solved it a little bit, but there's a lot of people who are players, not developers who haven't yet solved that. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, man, I know that's a long rant, but it's something I, know, I feel a good really one. passionate about. Because no. people, people aren't talking about it. It's a little bit of a, a secret, I think that if you play video games six hours a day, your life is not going to be as good as if you only play video games one hour a day. And that's a really controversial statement in our industry. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of the crew. I've played games my whole life. I've made games my whole life. I teach people how to make games. So I'm, I'm, I'm in the, I'm right in there with everyone, but you know, one hour healthy, six hours, not healthy is, is my feeling on this right at the moment for the state of the world and mental health. No, 100%. Because there's just so much that goes with playing games and, and getting distracted from your goals. Because you're talking about having mental health situation when you're playing too many games. But you can also have it where you're in the industry and like crunch time or you just feel like your skills aren't enough. Or, or it's not even that you're getting distracted by games. You just Everything becomes overwhelming. And it's just how to deal with that. It's been, it's been hard for anybody. Like you, I've asked all these people and it's not the same answer where it's just like, get over it it's more like i had to take a step back or i had to play less games or i had to take my system and just throw it out the window and like or like things like that where it's like i had to take drastic measures because what's happening to me isn't what i want it's like you said get angry people just got angry like yeah. i can't have this anymore i i hear now your original question was probably a little bit more about mental health people working in game design game development studios or in the industry itself yeah i've worked in a lot of studios and studios that are have a lot of crunch time are usually the studios that have meetings that go too long that aren't relevant for everyone who's in the meeting people who sit around chit chat a lot um, people who aren't focused on what's our number one priority decisions that get reversed and you zig and zag publishers who change their mind so there's a lot of inefficiency in the in the studios i've worked in that is the reason for crunch time you know oh crap we've got two months left and you know for this year-long thing we're trying to do and we wasted the first 10 months of it so if anyone finds themselves in that situation it's it's trying to work to make the the whole process more efficient 
and to prioritize what's the most important thing to be done so that when you get to the end, you might have missed out a couple of nifty features or you've got a couple of bugs to do, but at least you've got the bulk of the product created. And that's really, really tough for one, one individual on a team of one or two or 300 people to, um, you know, to raise that or make that change. But that's, that for me is the, the way forward is to be more efficient, more focused, as opposed to just simply saying, let's not work any crunch. Like that, so then, then people aren't proud of the product because you didn't make the thing you were trying to make. I agree. And now going back to what you were saying before about mental health and playing too many games. Now, do you think that there's this type of dilemma where they feel like they can't get good at anything else, so they only play games because it's the one thing that gives them immediate gratification? And they kind of, like, how would you help somebody who's like, feels like they're stuck and that there's no way out of this? Like, oh no, I can't do it. I can't be a programmer. So I'm just going to keep playing games all day. So is your question specifically how someone gets out of the trap of just yeah. constantly playing games or how someone becomes a developer? It's more of like how someone gets in this trap. It doesn't necessarily have to be just games, but it can be like this hole where it's like, hey, I can't get good at programming, so I shouldn't even try anymore. Or I okay. can't get good at this thing, so let me just keep playing games all day. Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, the reality might be you can't get good at that thing. That could be the reality. You know, maybe that's it because it's a choice this is my opinion everyone's cap everyone's capable of being good at programming or or 3d art or whatever they choose to be it's a choice and the choice is do i invest uh you know whatever eight hours a day for the next two years into getting good at this if you choose that you'll get good at it it's as simple as that it's nearly everything in life you know if you've if you've got the ability to do the thing like if it requires typing and you're able to type then you can do it like there's, you know, if it requires the internet and you've got internet, then you can do it. If it requires the internet and you don't have the internet, then and you're going to have to find another way to be able to do it. Cause that's, that's an mm. actual barrier. But if you have the, the tools and the, the, um, you know, the physical ability to do it, you can absolutely do it. So the thing that I would say to anyone who's sitting there saying, I can't be a good enough programmer is you're choosing not to be a good enough programmer. You, you're choosing for that to be the case. And if you're happy with that choice, then cool, just let it go. Be like, I'm, I'm not going to be able to good, be good enough as a programmer because I don't have the, what it takes to put in the time and the effort and the sacrifices to be good at it. Cool. Done. You've chosen that. You are therefore not good enough to do it. But if you look at it more objectively and say, um, but I, I want to do it. It's important to me to do it. Well, then the very moment you choose to do it, you are good enough to do it. It's the choice that determines whether you're good enough to do it or not. Um, so if you find yourself stuck, if you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I kind of, you know, chipping away at this, I'd really like to do it. I don't think I'll ever get there. Step one is to get out of there, like get out of where you're in at the moment, go for a walk, go, go find some trees, sit in a park and get away from whatever is the, the toxic environment that's pulling you in. It could be, you've got your computer and at your computer, you've got all your games and you've got YouTube and that's, you know, Reddit and that's what you're just doing take some time to get away from that environment and connect with the choice you're making. Write down the choice. I hereby choose to invest time into doing this. So you've got to, you've got to snap out of it somehow. And often that snapping out requires changing your environment, changing your situation. Uh, I think that physical exercise is the, the power to a lot of the mental procrastination problems. So if you're feeling like me, I've had times where I felt like a slob. I just don't feel good about myself. I'm low in energy. I'm not sleeping as well as I should. I'm not drinking water as much. I'm not eating. I'm eating crappy food and I'm not exercising. Then put all of your dreams on hold for one week. Like all of the conversations about I'm not a good programmer. I'm never going to be able to make games. I'm not going to get there, blah, blah, blah. Put all of that on hold and just, spend a week where you get the right amount of sleep, you drink tons of water, you stop drinking fizzy drinks, you cut down your caffeine, you stop eating cakes and potato chips and junk, you go for whatever your body can handle, go for a walk every day, go for a jog if you can jog, um, and you, you allow your body to be the catalyst for your mental discipline. Wow, that's beautiful. Hopefully people listen because the fuzzy drinks and the, the chips are hard to put down for they are, man. They yeah. Are. I, I, 
that just I've had that just recently. I'm I'm going through some challenging stuff in my life at the moment, you know, some some family personal stuff and it's very easy to get there and be like, "Oh, I'll just kind of, you know, take the mm-hmm. foot off the pedal and just eat whatever because it's easy, you know, not bother going out for a jog today." It, it's easy to get in that frame mm-hmm. of mind. And that's what I'm saying that my, the technique I'm working on now is getting angry about it because then it it jolts you into a different frame of mind. You're not just doing the same old, I should do that. I'm going to write a note on the wall. I'm going to type in my diary tomorrow. I will be better. Like sometimes those things work, but if they're not working anymore, you can do something different. Like just get up out of your seat, walk outside, stand on some grass, look at a tree because our body thrives with nature and get there and be like, I'm angry at how shit things are going at the moment. I'm going to do something about it. When I walk back in there, I'm going to go and delete these things that are getting in my way. I'm going to make a promise to my best friend. I promise by the end of the week, I will have not got drunk at all, whatever it is that's, you know, preventing you, Um, you know, make a commitment to someone and then sit down and do five minutes, no more, just five minutes of the thing that you've been putting off for the last three weeks, five minutes of it and say, tomorrow I'm going to do six minutes of it. The day after I'm going to do seven minutes of it and stop focusing on the fact that it's going to take you know, years to get good at a thing or do a thing or finish a thing, forget about that. That's a mountain. Don't try to climb the mountain. Just look at what I can do today that will have me pointing in the right direction. Take a step, take another step, take another step. Because what you find is if you're stuck, you cannot try to climb the mountain. You cannot take a huge, like I've got to do it all straight away. Don't do that. You've got to get to the point where it becomes a habit in your, in your body and in your mind to be, doing the good things and not doing the bad things, the distractions. So chip away at it slowly. Don't try to dive into the boss battle straight away. Practice, go through the tutorial level. That's what I'm saying in this. I like that. Go through the, we should name that the podcast episode. But yeah, so that's, that's a lot of great stuff about mental health, getting through stuff, getting through the rut. That, that's a great one too. It's just like, take a week off. That's why I've always mentioned it with all the guests because they've, the one thing they say is never give up. It's been a thing throughout mm-hmm. all you they're say it in different ways. It won't just be don't give up, but it'd be like, we'll just keep going. Or I, I didn't stop practicing even though I dropped out of school. But it's like it's like with that, take that one week off doesn't mean you stop trying for your thing. It just means you're taking a break, but you can still keep going. I I, I need that to like be a thing that's constantly a reminder to all the uh listeners and anybody else who listens to the podcast. It's just like you can take as long as you need. There's nobody else is yep. rushing. Like, don't listen to the other voices around you. Listen to what you want. Just because someone says, oh, well, I don't see you making progress with your game or with this or that. It's like, it's okay. It's my journey, my life. I decide how long it needs to be. Yep. Yeah. It, totally. It, there's a couple of things that I don't know if you've listened to much of Gary Vaynerchuk talk. I like him a yeah. lot. Gary V. Um, I recommend him a lot because he's just real. He's straight to it. And there's a couple of things that really, really stand out to me. Two things I'll talk about. One is... Um, you know, when people ask him, what's the best advice you got? I've seen him do this a couple of times. He's like, um, you are going to die. That, that's it. Like you, you get one, you get one shot. Well, in my opinion, you get one shot. You've got a limited amount of time. How are you going to spend that time is up to you. So just be conscious of that, that you don't have forever to diddle around with this. Like we're put on this world for a certain amount of time. So make use of that time. That's, that's the first thing not to get too heavy, but you know, you people drift through life like, Oh, I didn't even think about these things. So that's one thing that he talks about. The other thing um, he talks about, it's just popped out of my head. It'll pop into my head in a second. Is it patience? Oh yes. He he talks about, it might be that you can't do it. It might be, this is not for you. And a lot of people, I, I like what you're saying about don't give up. I think that's great advice for someone who knows where they're going and really wants to get there. I think a lot of people are living a life of should they're shooting their way through life. And I should really give this a good shot because I like video games and I should become a developer and that should be a good thing to do. Maybe it's not. If it's difficult, maybe it's not for you. The best things in life, you just do and it just happens, you know? So maybe there's a bit of, I think this is the right thing for me because it kind of makes sense and it kind of seems cool, but maybe the right thing for you is to be a landscape gardener and not a developer. Maybe if sitting in front of your computer all day long doesn't have your brain and body feel good. If you procrastinate so much that it just doesn't happen, then maybe it's not the right thing for you. So it's okay as well. Like 
don't give up on your dreams because someone else said something dumb. That's great advice. You know, forget about what anyone else says. You, if you want to do it, you go do it like to hell with them. But if you're sitting in front of your computer week after week after week, and you're like, I just kind of can't make myself do it. Then don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Do something else. It's not for you. Yeah. That's great. It's great advice. It's hard though. Cause you, you put so much time and effort into it. You're like, Shh, I don't want to give it up. I've already put all my time. Oh, that's a great point as well. Being, being um, pot committed, as you would say in poker, like you've already bet a hundred dollars on this hand, you know, the hand's probably not going to win, but I've already put hundred dollars into it. Um, you need to, you need to put a line through the past and say, that's the past. I might have all these skills and knowledge and experience and connections in this area, but you've got to look at the present today. What brings you joy today? What do you really want to be doing? not be scared about the future and not regret or be um, constrained by the past. Maybe to move on to things that are less deep, we could talk about brand. So someone asked, I wonder how you could build your own like game dev brand and sell stuff on your own without being employed by a company or another individual. So how you can build your own brand to, to do. So you can sell your own stuff without being employed by a company. So basically be an entrepreneur, um, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's never been a better time. It's we're living in a golden era. Of, you really are. You can spend, you can spend twelve and a half minutes and like five bucks, get a web page, make up any name because names don't matter when you're starting out. Honestly, particularly in game development, the company name doesn't matter. The product name might, but um, you know, just even use a placeholder name. Boop, you've done it. You've started. So the question is more about branding and marketing. Then obviously you want to have a conversation with your target audience. You want to know what it is your what need you're filling for them or what interest you're fulfilling for them. And then you, you try a whole bunch of things like here's seven ideas, which idea seems to be stronger. You, you've just got to involve whether it's building a game, whether it's building an app, building another product, who's going to buy it or play it or use it. Talk to them, talk to them, talk to them. Oh, I don't know where to find them. Well, that's, there you go. You've got your first problem to solve. Find those people, ask people where I find those people. So go out and find them, talk to them. And then, how do you do it? Not as an employer, sorry, as an employee, you just don't go and, you know, go and get a job. It's as easy as that. You just start doing it fire up a website, mm -hmm. tell your friends what it is you're doing, make a commitment and start researching just like there's no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. My, my wife has a couple of really good ideas for things that she is, has been working on for a while and wants to make, but she's been a little bit blocked by the, um, but what's the best way of going about doing this? What's the best product? What's, how do I execute this? And uh, she's going through a phase at the moment, which is don't even worry about the product, the result, the price, the positioning, the branding, the marketing. Take a certain amount of time, for example, a month, just to research everything you can. Research competitors, research tools you can use, research tech stack, talk to people, go and get a whole bunch of the products that are similar to what you might make or games or apps or whatever it might be, play them, use them, look at them and get to the point where at the end of that month or two months, however long it takes, you're like, I've got a pretty good idea how to do this now. Cause you've gone and become a little bit of an expert in that area. Now, if you're getting there and saying, but how do I, how do I develop a good game? The research phase might be a year, you know, to learn the skills, to practice, to make, you know, your, your game one, your game two, your game three, the games that don't make money, but allow you to progress your knowledge and your skills. So there might be a longer journey in there, but if it's a case of saying, how do I just, how do I become a, my own employer? How do I become an entrepreneur? Just a big ass research phase, and then just chuck up a quick website and then just do. It's as simple as that. Just do. There's, there's not a lot more to it. Don't worry about incorporating a company, trademarking things, getting lawyers. Don't worry about that. You only need to worry about those things when you're either about to earn a bunch of money or take on serious partners that want to know that you're all buttoned up with that. Up until then, those things don't matter at all. Just, just do. Hopefully that yeah, answers the question. I'm not sure exactly where the, where the question was positioned, but hopefully that has some useful nuggets in it. No, I think that was perfect. The whole thing, just, just do it though. It's as simple as that. It might not seem simple at first, but once you get into it, it becomes easier. I promise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, someone wanted to ask about your game dev rig YouTube channel where you have this like series with Tim, where you guys like talk about games and will it work? And they were wondering how like, what is the purpose of those videos? Like, is it, what is the goal you're trying to get for all the students watching those videos? 
yeah, I wish I wish we could do more of those. It's that's one of those sad things where okay, so what are they? It's, it's Tim Rustwick and I playing games and just talking about game design, mm -hmm. what works, what doesn't work, what we can learn from that particular game. Because you can talk about game design theory, but looking at game designs in practice. So let's look at this game. It's a platformer. How have they implemented the jump? You know, there's a double jump. How high can you jump? Why would they have done it this way instead of doing it that way? When you first come into the game in the first five minutes, do people know what to do? Do they have a tutorial? How long is a tutorial? So just analyzing games and really reviewing them from the perspective of what can we get out of this as game designers? A little bit what I was saying just before about research other things and learn from them rather than trying to generate everything from scratch yourself. So that was, that's the purpose of the series. And we did, I don't know how many, 10 videos and we love doing them, but you know, the business reality of YouTube and of um, getting feedback is that some people watched it and loved it, but not really, they, they weren't really sort of taking off. It wasn't something that tons of people were saying, yeah, we love it. They weren't getting lots of views. So um, unfortunately we, we just prioritized other activities that we thought would be more useful to the community or more useful from a business perspective and haven't been doing them so much, but uh, you know, we, we love doing them. It was something we we're just doing for fun in our spare time. Yeah, no, because it's really cool because that's really when you can learn when you get game designers in there and say, Hey, this is what worked. This is what didn't work. It helps make it more simple, I guess. Cause mm -hmm. you say again, theory, it's like, Oh, what does that mean? Well, let me show you. Oh, I get it now. Stuff like that is why I really enjoyed watching them too. Now, if the game like TV community enjoyed some of those, like if you did a poll, would you do it with like other instructors too? And have it be like a weekly or monthly thing? I'd love to, man. It's just priorities. There's only yeah. so many hours in the day. And um, at, at the end of the day, the tricky thing is that you've got to do the things that the most people will benefit from. Mm -hmm. And I find that in our community, the vast majority of people are interested in technical programming input because that's the thing they're like, I just don't know this. I can't figure this out myself. Mm -hmm. And it's only after you go through the journey of learning how to implement things, you know, getting some technical um, capabilities that you then get there and say, oh, but the design of this isn't very compelling. How do I make the design better? So in a way, it's a little bit more of a niche specialist type thing, the game design stuff. If there was enough interest, if there was enough people who would participate, you know, if we did it um, as a different sort of product, then yeah, that might be, you know, I'm going to make a note of that. Make a note. Of, that's a very interesting thing you've popped into my head. I got design. you. It's what I do best. <laughs> right, thanks, man. Because you know, uh, oh, Tim and I have be been cool. talking about Tim, Tim and I, Tim Ruswick and I have been talking about what's the number one thing that our community says they just can't find good resources for, and it's marketing. It just mm -hmm. comes up all the time, marketing, because they know um, I'm, they might not be there with their programming yet, but at least there's the thing that they can work through to get better at programming. But it's very difficult to find the solution to how do you take your game from three people played it to 3000 people played it there's no the the formula is not as easy it's a very difficult nut to crack yeah. um so yeah tim and i have been talking about how do we help our community with that more so we've got some some ideas there might be something coming down the pipe soon on that now, i'm just curious about the poll you guys took where you were asking how people watch the videos if they watch it once or watch it mm -hmm. twice and then do the challenges or follow along. What was the, what was the reason for that? Or was it just information? Yeah. It's, it's often when I'm, when I'm creating a video and I mm -hmm. think, Oh, I wonder if people, people want, want it to be a or B. So for example, I asked people, um, I polled recently or a while ago, actually, do you do the challenges? Cause part of the game dev TV way is that every video, every lecture, we have a challenge to make sure that you're not just watching mm -hmm. that you're actually doing. And I wanted to know are those challenges still relevant and useful. And the vast, vast majority of the community said, yes, we do the challenges. Every single challenge we do they're they're why we're here. It's part of what differentiates our content from other content, particularly differentiates us from YouTube because YouTube, you're not so much about, Hey, now go and do this thing. It's more about here's the answer to your question, but we're making a, uh, a learning journey. So we want to make sure people are actually doing they they've got capability after it. So just checking in on that to make sure that it's still valid. Uh, and then what was I asking recently about whether people do as they 
uh, as they go along and, and not just watch. That's a little bit of my assumption from what we've looked at in the past is the vast majority of people watch our lectures while on their computer and they're not watching our lectures sitting on the can with their cell phone. Uh, and so that was really just checking that because people are saying I'm implementing at the same time that I watch, then they're on their computer. You just can't implement on your phone. Unity is not going to programming unity on your phone is not going to go too well. So there, it's yeah, just yeah. a little bit of, it's just validating. Okay. That's, that's the mechanism. I didn't ask, do you watch our lectures on your computer? It was more a question of, do you follow along and create at the same time? And if people gave a different answer to what I was expecting, then it would change the way that we teach. That's interesting. Now, that's a good one because a lot of people, from what I learned, learning best happens when you like watch a video and then watch while implementing it and then like mm -hmm. dabble with it for like a couple hours. And then the next day, come back to like the next one. If you start cramming everything in, it just... You know it, but like you said before, you don't actually know how to do it. You're just like, oh, I've seen it before. I, I, I could do it. And then you go do it and you can't do it. Yeah, absolutely. So that reminds me of that. You've got to do. That's, yeah. That's, just everything do. in life is just do. Do, do, do. Action, action, action. That's the recipe. That's the secret. Oh, yeah. What do you think about like the PS5 and Xbox Series X? The new awesome. console generation. Can't, yeah. Can't wait. Like um, I've, been, I've been a PC gamer for a long time and I find that it meets most of my needs. I tend, I haven't had a console for, for a while um, in my house and I get my, you know, I get my gaming from Steam mostly because I find that, you know, it's most of the things I want to play are there. Um, but I'm, it's like any new generation of console, it's going to produce even better experiences for players, even cooler, niftier things. So yeah, I'm really excited. I think PlayStation has been winning for a while, but there's a lot of mumblings I hear that Xbox is, you know, about to about to take over the mantle again and then purchasing companies like Bethesda and no doubt having a lot of first party, you know, just going after a lot of first party titles or exclusive titles, sorry, um, is going to help move the needle as well. But uh, I'm excited. It's going to be a good okay. time. Cool. But yeah, but so then that's pretty much it. We've uh, we've talked for a while now about game design, mental health, the future, VR, PlayStation Five, and all that's left is a challenge for the community. So we can come up with a little challenge for them. Hmm, good one, good one. Uh, challenge for the community would be to make a commitment for the next thirty days to do something that will improve your life, and tell someone about that commitment and take the action to do it. So, for example, something that could be finishing a project, uh, health and fitness, having the conversations you've been putting off, getting your taxes done, whatever it might be, make a commitment of something that you know will improve your life and tell someone about it and then do it. That's my challenge. Good one. So yeah, so thank you for coming on the podcast. It was awesome. And the mic to you so you can leave a shout out or some inspiration quote or whatever you want to leave us with. But thank you for coming on, Rick. Thanks, KB. Awesome. Yeah, it just and 100 podcasts soon. That's awesome. Good work to, to you and the other crew that you've been doing the podcast with. What I would say is that I really, really love seeing when people create something as part of our courses and then post that and share it with us. So uh, videos are the best. It's a little bit less likely people will play it. Here's the link to my itch.io or wherever, but take a video, share it with us because we, I love it. I love seeing that. I love seeing someone take project boost and change it or take argon salt and turn it into a mech or uh, take our zombie runner and turn it into their own first person shooter. So, um, you know, continue to do that. That's why myself and the team do it is to see people achieve themselves and create the things they want to create. So, um, you know, thanks for everyone in the community who's been creating awesome projects and sharing it so that we can see it. Well, that's it. Thanks for listening. You can find all GameDev.TV courses at courses.gamedev.tv slash courses or in the show notes with a 10% discount. Get started with your game development journey today.